Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is Jock here, and this is the Pillars of Grief, and I'm delighted, as promised, to bring my very good friend back for part two of our discussion on grief. And uh, this is uh, Dr. Charlson Gaines, who is a psychologist. And uh, if you haven't actually listened to the last episode, then what are you doing? Jump back and listen to that episode because that's going to frame up what we are talking about now. Okay, Charlson, welcome back, my friend. How are you? I'm good, I'm good, and I'm, I'm glad to be back. I appreciate you having me here again. Oh, absolutely. Look, I mean, the last time we, you know, we got right into it, we were talking about your experiences, we were talking about, you know, obviously how you lost your mother. But as we were going through that conversation, you know, we, we realized that there's so much more to grief than meets the eye. And the thing is, as you and I both know, when, when, when people think grief, they immediately think loss of a loved one. Somebody's dead. Somebody's passed over. Actually, and I don't tend to like to use that word dead because it's kind of so final. So right. that, that's not the way that I kind of think about things. But it's, it's people equate that word with death and passing over. But you and I both know that there is so much more to this, so much more to grief because it's, it's covering all sorts of loss. So we're going to dive into that tonight. And uh, and hopefully you guys that are listening, if you've got any questions after the show, then send it in to us because then that will allow us to come back and answer those questions as well. So um, what do you think about that? What do you think about us, you know, this, this whole idea of grief being bigger than what people actually think it is, Charleston? Well, I think that when people talk about grief involving or being centered around the loss of life, losing someone that you love, that's that data is easy to process. It's, it's almost linear, right? So you lose someone, you suffer grief. That's the process. That's the linear, yeah. whatever, sequential event. But when yeah. we do that, what we're doing is we're essentially trying to define a process that's not really definable because grief is more than just our dictionary definition. It's yeah. almost like, did you experience loss? Yes or no. Did you experience grief? Yes or no. As if it's that simple. And it's really not. And of course, you can have one aspect. I mean, you can lose a loved one but and have that form of grief. But at the same time, you could lose something like your job and have that form of grief and then now you've got two forms of grief that are exacerbating and feeding each other. And so that, that becomes, I mean, a real big psychological uh, potential for disaster right there. So, I mean, there's, there's so many aspects. Um, and I know in my, in my life, I've lost a lot, you know, I've lost loads of loved ones. And, and, but I've also lost, you know, things that have made me think about grief in a different way. You know, there's the sense of loss of identity. The sense of loss of, uh, you know, even if you lose something as simple as a, a pet, let's say, for instance, we talk about a pet or losing something like that, then um, that can cause us a, a mass amount of anxiety and depression. What You know, give us an example, uh, Charleston, about your, a, a time in your life where you actually experienced loss, but not necessarily from a loved one's point of view. Well, I'll say this. A lot of times when we think about grief and we associate it with the loss of a loved one or someone passing away, what we do is is we we put those two together. So then if we're experiencing another kind of loss, we don't know what that is. So we don't know we're experiencing it. And so I'll give you an example that a lot of people don't think about. Um, and this is a simplified version, but this is yeah. something that happened to me in... 2019, um, I lost a very important friendship. Mm. There was a misunderstanding and we quit being friends. And I'm going to tell you that, again, it goes back to allowing yourself to feel, allowing yourself to experience yeah. whatever you're going through. Because mm. when a man in his 40s says, 
we're not friends anymore. It sounds funny. <laughs> I lost my best friend. <laughs> it, it sounds funny. I, I, it's my ball and you're no playing. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it sounds funny, but but in reality, that all of those things make up who you are. Mm. And they are part of the way that you perceive your world, the world around you. You know, as far as how you think things are today, how you expect things to be in the future, things mm. external to you. And so when you lose that, you grieve. And it's not like a choice. It's it's you find it impacts your mood and impacts your thoughts. Like you're just not in the mood to do anything. You know, things that used to interest you, they don't anymore. But because you don't consider losing a friend as an adult to be something worthy of grieving, you'll judge yourself. Why do I feel this way? What's the big deal? It's not supposed to be important. Yeah. And in reality, it's your body's grieving whether your brain knows it or not. That's interesting because I was going to ask you, I mean, w w this was obviously before you became, you know, doctor of psychology, obviously. Um, but did, could you recognize the pattern of grief in that behavior or did you not know what, you know, I, I, this is new to me. I don't know what's going on. I don't know. I don't understand this. Well, I'll, I'll tell you this, I'll tell you this. And this is one reason why I have so much respect for you. And I really appreciate the work that you do, Jock, is because mm. I didn't recognize how grief was associated with things like that. Mm. Till after you and I had a conversation a few yeah. months ago. Yeah, that's so I, yeah, that's true. Yeah, yeah. So I knew, I knew that it hurts, but I didn't call it grief. Interesting. You know? mm. And and the reason why that's important is because if you can label it, you can do something about it. It's right? that awareness phase, isn't it? You become aware of it, then exactly. you you can. You know, you kind of make the choice after you have the awareness. Exactly. Your camera is falling everywhere. Is it? <laughs> I keep I keep messing with my camera. That's not good. But now, for those of you that are listening on the podcast, you can't see nothing. But he is wobbling his camera like crazy. So <laughs> and those of you who are, those of you who are watching on YouTube, yeah, this is another entertainment an entertainment uh, aspect of this show. So. Um, <laughs> <it's> like, <laughs> but I'm listening, so ask me another question. Let's keep so, going. So, so he is listening. So you didn't you didn't understand this. So you didn't really understand that that was grief. But and and let's equate this to other people that might not understand that that might that that's grief. What was it? Let's let's go into your feelings. What was it? You said you were feeling sad and everything else. But what other feelings did you feel in that? aspect of loss if you like well what you feel is and, and i'm gonna tell you what what a lot of people don't recognize is that all of your relationships all of your connections impact the way that you feel about yourself if i think that you are a high quality person yeah i, I think that you're a person that you have my back and i'm worthy of our friendship yeah. Then I lose you as my friend. I question why. Sometimes I know exactly what I did. It's a misunderstanding. You perceive it differently than I do, but mm. I know exactly why. And other times you don't know why. And so when you think about it, what happens when you kind of lose your sense of self-worth? Well, it's physiological. Mm. So it impacts your mood, your happiness, your appetite. Your, how you're able to sleep. It impacts all of those things. And what you don't realize is that you are, you're trying to recover, but it's not just your thoughts. Like a loss is a blow. And so your body is trying to recover. And so, yeah, I didn't know that what I was experiencing was loss, but I knew that it, it impacted my mood, my appetite, my sleep habits, and the way that I viewed my overall worth. And that's partly because this friend that I lost, I thought was an amazing person. Did, did that affect you? I know you say that it affected your worth, right? And it affected the way that you felt about yourself. Did that affect 
you with other relationships, perhaps in a work environment or perhaps just even in your own your own environment? It it does. And for a lot of people who know why they feel a certain way, mm. they're able to hide it. But hiding it is not the same as not being impacted. So you may be going through something, right? Regardless of the emotion. And then when you're at your place of work, you got to hide it. You got to fake it, things like that. So it does impact you whether you are willing to admit it or not. And, and again, it's, it's impacting you physiologically. So you can tell yourself it doesn't matter. And we see that crap all the time, like on social media. Yeah. Don't listen to other people. It doesn't matter. Who cares what they think? You didn't need them. Cut them off. And so when we're done with the stupid quotes, let's connect with how we actually feel. Yes. Yes, because that's surface level stuff that they're talking about. And the reality is, is I, I often find that the reality is that people that are doing that and shouting it, it doesn't matter. You know, you, it don't, don't, you don't care what other people think. And there's, there's a certain element of truth into that. But, you know, when you're feeling the way you feel through the loss that you've experienced, whether it's, it's, it's a friendship or another relationship, um, it does affect you psychologically. It does affect you in your, even in your health. You know, I've, I've known people who have lost relationships and it's impacted them in a big way, not only physiologically, but biologically as well. And um, we don't, the thing is, is I don't think society really understands the impact of grief and what grief actually is. Because we can compartmentalize it into just saying it's loss. But what does that really mean? Loss can, of what? I, I, can, I can really dig into this. And so first of all, I'm, I'm going to come from the, um, from the opposite angle. The opposite angle being needing for people to understand mm. the impact of loneliness. So mm. research has shown that loneliness is more likely to cause early death than obesity, alcohol abuse, and smoking. In fact, loneliness contributes to those other things. I was going to say, so loneliness impacts grief. It, it really does, but quite often when you lose a friendship or a, a relationship, right? And, and, you know, even when I went through a divorce last year, then you feel you feel lonely, and so and you and you were grieve. Well, you didn't know this at the time, but you were also grieving at the same time. Well, well, very much so, very much so, grieving at the same time. Mm. And the thing about it is, so the grief contributes to the loneliness. You're lonely because where there know, was a wait, relationship. Wait, 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 I would say so. I love that you're saying that the grief contributes contributes to the loneliness. Right. But also the loneliness contributes to the grief. Exactly, exactly. And, and so it really depends on... Uh, I'll, okay, let me tell you this other thing. After experiencing trauma, social support is the number one... Um, I can't think... The number, social support is the number one factor if you're going to experience PTSD or post-traumatic yeah. growth. Yes, and so what happens a lot of times is you suffer a loss, and so there's grief. And so you're lonely. And so I say grief contributes to loneliness, and you say loneliness contributes to grief. Well, what happens is grief yeah. contributes to loneliness, and if you have social support, you have a circle, you have people that love you, people that can be there for you, then that can kind of buffer the loneliness. But if not, then yes, the loneliness feeds back into the grief. So it's this cycle, but if, if oh, I was just going to say real quick, if you don't realize that you're grieving, then you don't yeah. position yourself to stop the cycle. I love this. Let's go deeper into this because here's the other thing. So, you know, you and I, you know, both, I, I study post-traumatic uh, stress and also post-traumatic growth and prolonged grief disorders, one of the two things that I really focus on. And one of the things I found out, if I found in my research is that, I love how you say that you you know it, one feeds the other and the loneliness is exacerbated, but it, it's a buffer if you're socially connected. However, 
you can still be what I found in my research is you can be essentially socially connected or, or as an illusion, but be actually totally disconnected because people then who are suffering really deep grief and then the loneliness comes in, even though it's that old saying, isn't it? That you can, you can be the loneliest man in a party in the room when everybody's there. So while the illusion is that there's social connection, in reality, psychologically, there's massive disconnection, which would probably exacerbate the grief and the loneliness even more. Well, it, it definitely would. And a big part of that, <laughs> I just, I feel like we, sh you and I should actually be in the same room and have six hours to talk about <laughs> it. But, but the truth is, so, so how can you be, how can you have a long list of people that you call friends, like mm. legitimate, valid friends? But you're still lonely. There's a couple different reasons why. First of all, it's your ability to be vulnerable. Mm, yes. Can I open up? Am I am I open to receiving the social support? You sitting in the same room with me might be social support. It might not be. It yeah. depends on the barriers I've created or that I've taken down. And so then, so there's that aspect of are you really open to that? And then another part of it is, again, your perspective, because when we say vulnerability is strength, another way to look at that is if you care about me, if you're my friend, you really care about me and you want to be there for me. And I put up that barrier. I am being selfish with mm -hmm. my grief. I'm not giving you the opportunity and privilege to use your love and our connection to help me. I'm not opening up myself to let you be the kind of friend that you want to be in your heart. Oh, this is such a double edged sword here. Absolutely. <laughs> I, do you know, and, and I see this in people who have lost loved ones. I, I did a I had a lesson a long time ago on my other YouTube channel and it was um or on this YouTube channel it was lesson, but it was it was about the selfishness of grief and how, you know, that goes into the all the afterlife and stuff like that. But there is an aspect of the selfishness of grief and being selfless at the same time as well. Where we I think the person who's grieving, whether it's loss of a loved one, whether it's loss of a relationship, doesn't know how to be vulnerable. Yes. They, that's the problem is that they, 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 they don't know how to be vulnerable because if they did, then maybe there wouldn't be that disconnect there and maybe there wouldn't be that massive imbalance and they wouldn't feel as lonely, but they don't, they, really they don't know what vulnerability is and what it means to be vulnerable. Yeah, and, and part of that is, especially in the, in the loss of, in the loss of a relationship where, where you are kind of using your manhood or masculinity as kind of the, the foundation of how you judge yourself, right? So, so yeah. let me give you an example. When I was in, I think I was in high school or something, and this song came out called Return of the Mac. Oh, and like whenever turn of the Mac. Exactly. Return of, <laughs> return of the Mac. And so yeah. and so when you're when you all of a sudden become single, you get divorced or whatever, you're a man, it's supposed to be or the return of the Mac. Look at me, I'm back. I'm a man. Yeah. Yeah. And when I do that, let's let's look at how I am treating you. When I do that, when I say, All right, now I'm a Mac, I'm back, and I'm secretly hurting inside. Yes. I am denying you my right. authentic self yes you're painting an illusion right and to a protect lie. myself you're living a lie Ex yes exactly and and living a lie to protect myself from my friends it doesn't even make sense no but that's, when the, you're that's grieving, the element of selfishness in your grief as well yeah. but when you're grieving you don't know that's happening no but also when it's a divorce, loss of a friendship, maybe your maybe your girlfriend or boyfriend you broke up and then you think, well, we were only together for a few months, so I shouldn't be hurting this man. So you don't even 
you don't even know that it's grief. So you're fighting the grieving process. You're trying to not even get into it. I think there's a stigma attached to it as well. You, would, the pet, you don't want to admit to yourself that you're grieving. Because, again, we have that whole attachment to death. But the reality is, is that it is, it's almost like the death of a relationship or an identity or something, you know, where you have that and then it's created this disconnect. So, I mean, I, I can understand that from that point of view. But a lot of people, they're so, they, they, I think there's a fear of what grief is. And there's also a fear of vulnerability. So, you know, like you said, the Mac is back. And, and he's grieving, but he doesn't want to show it. And then he's, he's, he's living in a sense of fear of what? A fear of what? Being judged because he becomes vulnerable and shows his grief? Well, it, it, it's exactly that. And I'll tell you a big part of it. And I'm going to say this for men because I, I, haven't, I haven't done too much reading or research on this from the perspective of a woman. But for men, a lot of us have not experienced the kind of relationships where we have what we would call um, unconditional love. Like even if we are loved unconditionally, oh, God, yeah. mm -hmm. we don't even recognize it. So we think that and we could be completely wrong, but we think that we're loved because of what we do and what we provide. And so I think that if I cannot continue to provide this to you, then I'm going to lose value and worth to you. And the truth is, that's not fair to you. And by being unfair to you, I am creating a barrier for myself that keeps me lonely and grieving. Do you think that I love the fact you bring up this unconditional love aspect because um there's an element where one person can't show unconditional love and the other person can't receive it. But at the same time, I would, I would venture that even the person who's grieving is unable to show unconditional love because if they did, there wouldn't be that element of loneliness. Yeah, I, I agree with you. And at the same time, I think that the grief can be so overwhelming that yeah. you're not even thinking about that. Like your grief is, is preventing you from loving others the way that you should. But you don't know that you're grieving. And so you're just trying to man up and work through it. And here's the thing about when you are grieving, you try to man up and you try to work through it and you try to be strong. Mm. If you wouldn't tell your friends to man up after a loss then don't tell yourself that. That's brilliant. <laughs> yes, I like that. It's true because you wouldn't dream of a really close friend who was going through some loss or, or you know, whether it was grief of a loved one, you wouldn't say, just get over it, man up, you know, don't be a wuss. Yeah. Because yeah. you would have compassion. So here's the other thing. There's that element of lack of compassion in our grief for ourselves. So if we're, if we're, if we're, so even, so here's the thing. I want to go, can I go to your divorce? Your, yeah, uh, we can, yeah, yeah, yeah let's, so, let's hit all of it. <laughs> let, let, let's go there. So when, when, you, when you divorced, um, which was a recent divorce for you, I would think that there was that you had a lack of compassion for yourself because you would probably be in that questioning phase or that, you know, looking at yourself in a negative light. What did I do? Why did I lose this per this person? Why was why did this happen? What what about me? So I, I guess in in this different level of grief that we're talking about and unconditional love and being vulnerable, compassion for you, for the self is is a massive factor and how deep you grieve. Yeah, yeah self-compassion is definitely a massive factor, but one thing about grief that severely limits self-compassion is not even understanding what's going on. And so, and when I say not understanding what's going on, you have the data, you have the information. Divorce is 
final on this day. So you understand that, right? No one needs yeah. to explain yeah. this happened on this day. Yeah. But on a deeper level, and, and I, I've been thinking and talking about this more often lately. I think the individual's name, I think her last name is FOA. FOA and a lot of her research was in the early early 90s and she talked about shattered assumptions theory. Okay, so you, yeah, I've heard of that. I haven't I haven't researched any of her stuff. I will know. Well, so you have assumptions about yourself, the world around you and the future. And mm -hmm. so what I'm about to say is is so simple, right? <laughs> so what happens is and and I'll use my divorce as an example. I had this assumption about things we were going to do in the future. Yes. So my assumptions about the future have been shattered. I had assumptions about the world around me. For example, when this happens, we may do these things together as a team. Mm. Well, that was sh that shattered. And then for myself, one day I was somebody's husband and the next day I wasn't. And so, so my view of, go ahead. So now we're jumping into because this is another element of, of grief and loss is now we're losing identity. We're grieving yes. identity as well as the loss of the relationship. So now we have two factors of grief in, in, in this one journey. Yeah. And, and you look at, and you say in this one journey, so let's look at where you are in this journey. When you're asking, okay, now who am I? And you're asking that question in your mid forties yeah. is different than being a teenager trying to figure it out. Yeah. So, okay, who am I really? Because who I thought I was, I'm not that person. And that's where the self-compassion comes in. Self-compassion will say, it's okay. Don't worry about it just relax let time heal reach out to your friends who love you and got your back but if you can't be vulnerable and mm -hmm. you don't grasp or understand or if you're not available to self-compassion then you sit there lonely grieving and in a case of divorce maybe you don't know you're grieving and so mm -hmm. you just sit there in pain and you don't know why imagine the pain of a broken arm and so you feel the pain of a broken arm mm -hmm. But you don't know it's coming from your arm. You don't know where it's coming from. What are you going to do? You're just going to sit there until you figure out there. what it is. Mm, mm. And, but you're embarrassed. So you don't call anyone and ask for help. And you feel stupid. And you can't feel stupid and feel self-compassion at the same time. Am I going to love me or am I going to judge me? I can't do both at the same time. Why have we got, why do, why do you think that we have got to this level as a society? Because this seems to be, look, we, we've got this underlying theme that we've talked about many times and, and people don't understand grief. It's, it's just a name, it's a word and it's equated with one thing and that's it. But where have we gone wrong in society that we have to have so much silent suffering because of fear? and ignorance of what grief actually is. Oh, you know, the, the first thing that comes <laughs> to mind for me, the first word that came to mind for me was a lack of vulnerability. Wow. People, okay. People are afraid to ask, Jack, I'm going through this. What is happening to me? It's hard to ask yeah. people that. When you say, hey, what's going on? And I don't know. I don't know that grief is the word that I'm looking for. So what do I tell you what's going on? Nothing. It's kind yeah. of been a long I'm day, a, but I'm it's okay. It's all good. It's all good, dude. Yeah. 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 And, and so what happens is we're unable to connect. And a lot of times when we're unable to connect due to a lack of vulnerability, it works both ways. So then maybe when you're hurting, you don't come to me yeah. because when I was hurting, I closed you off and okay, I might, I might look, I might hit some nerves with this one. Why are we so um, lacking in vulnerability? Because when we were children, we didn't get hugs and kisses and I love you's enough. 
We oh, weren't made to feel safe and secure yes. with a healthy sense of self-love. People don't understand. It's literally quantitative. Hug people more. Hug your kids more. Hug your wife more. Hug your husband more. Hug your sister, brother, mm. cousins. Hug them more. Because the more you know, your body feels really, connected. That, you know, that is really... You hit the nail on the head there because... I'd never had a lot of hugs from my father. And we, and we never had a, that as close a relationship or anything. Yeah, of course, with my mum and stuff like that. But um, but then, obviously, when I lost my father, then the grief was different. You know, was, I went through that whole right. that whole loss. But you're absolutely right. We never... I, I guess we would learn to be more vulnerable if our parents were more vulnerable and opened with us. Exactly. So, so here's the thing. Here's the thing you say, if our parents were more open and vulnerable with us, how many kids know when their parents are hurting? If you can see, oh, your, yeah. mm -hmm. if you can see your dad handle or deal with having his feelings hurt, you might learn how to deal with it when you're an adult. But there are so many people who have never They've never seen their dads cry. And so oh, I have, but that was when, when Scotland lost the World Cup, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. or, or or when his favorite racehorse when he just lost, you know. What I mean yeah. no, I know I I jest, but there is a serious I mean I, I get it. There's a, <laughs> yeah. there's a serious yeah. side to it. <laughs> yeah, and, and and it's, it's one of those things where you're like, as a kid, okay, so it's, a, it's okay to cry then, but why is, why is it okay to cry when you lose the World Cup? Because that's a part of wanting to belong. We're all doing that. We're all trying to belong and not even knowing where we need to belong. Right. But when you have your feelings hurt and you don't know what it looks like, to heal from that. And I'm talking about someone hurting your feelings. I'm, I'm, I'm not even talking about grief. Mm -hmm. We don't know what our parents look like when someone insulted them at work. We just know that when they came home, they said, like, don't talk to me right now. Like, like go, to, go to your room and play. They said things like that. They didn't say, I had a really bad day at work. I got in an argument with a friend. So they didn't, Watch or, or, as you, or as you suggested, that friend relationship ended and fizzled. And so they're beginning the grief journey and then taking that into the home environment and, and, and other relationships. So it's impacting the whole dynamic. It, it really is. And, and again, going back to what is grief, a couple of things. First of all, if you recognize that you are grieving and why, and then you recognize that choosing vulnerability and self-compassion will help you heal, mm -hmm. those things really elevate your ability to transcend grief and then return to a state of emotional normalcy. But if you don't, and, and when I say if you don't know you're grieving, it may sound silly to some people, right? But mm. let me explain. <clears throat> For my marriage, the the coming undone part lasted a long time. You don't go to the store and buy a divorce. There's a process. Oh, yeah. I've been there. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. so you know what's coming. The same way you know that someone is going to pass away from cancer. But what happens with cancer is when they pass away from cancer, it is final. Mm. It's, it's final. But when the divorce mm. happens, depending on your situation, like having kids, yeah. sharing assets, the person who left you, you still see them every day. They're still there. And so there's still a, a piece of hope. So if I'm still holding out hope, how can I grieve? And so then I'm an emotional wreck. And so what happens is you can still have those because we had an amicable divorce. And so we were still friends. We still had each other's back. We still did things for each other. And so I didn't get deep into grieving for like another eight months. I did not realize that mm -hmm. I was on a slow 
downward trajectory. I didn't uh, yeah, even know I, it. Mm, I remember when you, as you were, I mean, going through it and, and you have your good days, you have your bad days, but inevitably the grief creeps up on you very, very slowly. Yes. And it eats away at you. It eats away at you slowly as well. It's like a necrotizing disease. Yeah. So, so here's something for you. And, and I want to get your take on it. All right, go for it. So this, <laughs> this, this is, I don't know. I don't know how common this is because I'm, I'm the kind of guy that I never really dug into spirituality. Okay. But some events in my life had, have led me to be more open-minded about it. And, yeah, mm-hmm. you know, and, and the idea of, of your mind and brain being separate. And the reason I'm saying that to you is because after my divorce, mm. I'm telling you, man, I had a, I dreamed about her every single night for like six or seven months, literally every night. And some of the dreams were dreams like in my dream, we were watching TV mm-hmm. in my dream. She comes home from the store. So I'm not talking about like, like vietnam flashbacks no 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 yeah yeah yeah. and and so it's Mm -hmm. like so to be connected on that level and and to even be trying to get over her but i dream about her while i'm trying to get over her and it's like i i don't i don't even know what to say so i'm just gonna i'm gonna put it to you like that (laughs) like that's like i want to get over someone grieve this loss of someone yeah. who I dream about every night and I see almost every day when I do things like see our kids yeah. or, and, and just other things that we were still doing together. So there's, there, there's, there's a couple of aspects to look at it from because essentially there's the, there's the, there's the aspect of you grieving in the material world which is very kind of finite and it's very so much in the conscious expression you as you said you know what's coming it's in your you know it's in it's in your it's your thought process in your brain because you're connected consciously to the material level but then there's that spiritual connection there's the higher the higher self if you like let's you know let's kind of go let's say that it's it's, it's two separate beings you've got the you know the 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 Charleston that's on the material world and then the higher self on the other world. And the higher self doesn't see, it doesn't necessarily equate with this negativity that you've gone through. There has to be, you have to blend both together. So it's like my work, for instance, as, as a medium, and I didn't want to go into that side of things, but I, I have to be able to raise my vibration enough so that I can go up and I can vibrate and I can meet loved ones on the other side in that vibration. So essentially, I'm having to scale that way. Well, here's the thing is your your higher self has got to come down at the same time as you're coming up so that you can get balance. You've also got to remember that there's, we know you were together for so long and you had children. There's still a love connection there. Right, and so we take that love connection away from the material world. That is a spiritual love connection. That's that that, and that won't ever die. Even it won't ever fade. Even though that you're separated, your souls are still connected in some way. Right, yeah. there's still a vibrational attachment there. Whilst it may vibrate differently, there is still that there. And so your your soul is yearning for expression, and your your higher self is yearning for expression. And your higher self wants peace and harmony and love. But that doesn't often equate to what happens in the material world because if if you start to vibrate higher and your partner is not willing to, you know, work with you and meet with you on that vibrational plane, then obviously you've got magnetic, you don't have magnetic attraction, you have magnetic repulsion. And that's when two things separate. And so then you have divorce, you have breakdown of relationship. But essentially, it's not the same as it is in, in, in the world of spirit, or it's not the same as it is in, in a divine sense, because we don't have that. We have duality and, and karmic imbalance here in the material world, but we don't have duality in the spirit world. See, you, you say that, 
And then what did we speak on earlier? Self-compassion. So yeah. everything that you just explained, what helps with that? Self-compassion. Self-compassion. Absolutely. Yeah. And self-compassion, so compa- it's, it's, it's an element of, I want to say it's, it's not a divine law essentially, but self-compassion is a, is, is a divine power. And so that, that compassion is existent in the spiritual realm. And we have to, it, so the mind and brain connection, it, it kind of comes down to this, right? Is, is the, you know, I've had this argument lots of times, is the brain an expression of the mind, right? Or as some scientists would say, that the mind is in the brain. So for me, the brain is an expression of the mind. So essentially, the compassion that you have is a divine power, and you have to express it. You have the choice, you have to express that in your material world to start to bring that vibration up and that harmony up. Yeah, that's exactly right. And what makes it easier for that to happen is for you, first of all, to have self-compassion like we spoke on. And another thing is for you to recognize that you are grieving. And so, yeah, yeah, and, and so part of that is recognizing that grieving is physiological. So you may not say that you're grieving, you may not think that you're grieving, but your body doesn't care what your brain thinks. No. And so you have to be able to recognize and answer the questions, why am I going through this? And when, and when I say, why am I going through this? I'm talking about certain physiological things that may not make sense to you. Why is it that mm. now I cannot sleep at all? Why is it that sometimes I will randomly just feel overwhelmed with sadness what is going on well so grief our is emotional what's going on. our emotional capacity our emotional experience is then expressed yeah. in our physiological and our biological experience because we don't you know we, we can't sleep anymore we're anxieties we feel sick we so really our emotions are also connected here and and that's causing us a great imbalance so we have to become aware of the right. emotional roller coaster that we're on and, and so then what you do to, to kind of tie it all together is a, a lot of it is not just awareness, but acknowledgement. Like, I have to admit to myself, this physiological reaction within me is tied to this event. Then I can say, why? Mm. And I can answer the question, honestly, because I loved... Like, not just the person, but what I expected in the future and the way that I perceive the world around me. And so when those things are broken down, I've lost part of my identity. And when we most often talk about grief, we don't dive deep enough into I've lost a part of myself. That sounds, so much. Yeah. That sounds nice when we're talking about losing a loved one. So you and I were one and you passed away and I lost a part of me. But we don't say that when things such as getting fired from a job that you love. There, there was lost, an individual. Yeah. There was an individual. This was an ordeal that I witnessed and kind of was a part of on Facebook. There was this individual that was in the Air Force for 27 years. And he was the highest enlisted rank. He was a chief master sergeant. And he had PTSD. And so the way the military works is they have what's called a medical board and they say let's look yeah. at your medicals and yeah. if you're if we determine that you're not fit to stay in the military then we're going to force you to get out or retire or whatever it is but for him at, after being in for 27 years he was being forced to retire and so mm-hmm. he and people knew this and they wanted to celebrate him they loved him but then on Facebook just out of nowhere there's this long rant Who am I? All I know, I am chief. This is who I am. And uh, his identity was shot. And other people responded. Well, they responded with compassion, but some other people were like, bro, you're 27 years old. I mean, you've been in 27 years. You're just going to have a career change. People have career changes all the time. People get out of the military all the time. What's the big deal? And see, that don't help because that's just platitudes. It, it really is. And so what happened is he was overwhelmed with grief about losing his identity. 
not just the thing he did to get paid, but everything about him was mm. was tied into that. Changed. Everything changed. Right. And, and so for him, you know, back to being vulnerable, you can be forced out like he was. But if you don't know how to be truly vulnerable and open to receive compassion and open to self-compassion, then mm. the people who love you the most, like his wife and adult kids, he's not even open to receiving their love and support. You know, one thing that we yeah. do in grief is we tell everyone else they won't understand. And essentially, we 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 kind of that this comes into belief as well because then we we believe they won't understand, but we don't give them an opportunity to try. Right, right, exactly. And so, like, what happens is, well, well, let me talk first about delayed onset PTSD. Right. And so some people develop PTSD shortly after the trauma. Some people develop PTSD months or years later. It's delayed onset. Yeah. And so what happens is like delayed onset grief, which I I would say that's what I had. Yeah, it, it, I would it, say so. It, yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it took a while to come on. Mm -hmm. But when you're so busy saying I'm OK. And creating barriers and not letting people in, not being vulnerable, lying to yourself, no self-compassion, not just allowing yourself to feel. Then as you move towards delayed onset PTSD or delayed onset grief, you have opportunities to stop that process through self-compassion, through friendships. But you don't stop it because you don't let other people in. And so you have no awareness of it. Exactly, exactly. You don't even know what you're doing. You don't even know what you're doing. There's no awareness there. The first stage that we need to do in anything is to become aware of it. Right. And, and so what happens is, or, or what should happen is, moving your ego out of the way so that you can even admit to yourself what hurts, what you don't know, what you don't understand. And then if you can't answer any of those questions, go ask somebody. Do you know, it's, it's like when you cut, it's like when you cut your hand, right? Someone and someone witnesses you cutting your hand. We do this. I'm good. Yeah, no problem. Last a plast on that. We'll cover it up. We're fine. Instead of being truthful and saying, you know what, this is, I'm, I'm feeling a bit sick. I'm feeling a bit, this has really got into me. I'm losing blood and being truthful about it. We tend to, we, we tend to create this air of this illusion that everything in the garden is rosy and we're fine and we'll break through it. And, and the reality is, is we, we, we have, we don't really have an awareness of our own vulnerability and our own power. So you, you mentioned the garden and this analogy just came to me. So you go out to the garden and it's like everything in the garden is fine. Yeah. Ex except the gardener. Exactly. That's it. Right? <laughs> the garden looks great, but the, 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 the garden is planting weeds instead of seeds. And, and doesn't even realize it and is afraid to ask for help. And so I think I think those are the kind of the main things that we need to understand about grief is that you can grieve a loss and you can't, or it doesn't help to judge yourself, like trying to determine was the loss big enough for me to grieve. Sometimes stuff hurts more than you expected it to. And so you're thinking, oh, well, I only knew her for six or seven months and mm. we were just friends. So why does it hurt this way? And, and it's things like that where let me just let me just admit and acknowledge that it hurts. And so that's the beginning of the recovery process. And then it's so without self-judgment and then to say, OK, this hurts more than I was expecting in this grief process. What is happening in my body? I don't understand. Who can I talk to? You have to put your ego aside ask for help and do things to elevate your own happiness. Yeah, absolutely. I've noticed that a lot of people who have 
loss and and not just loss of a loved one, but especially the loss of a loved one. What made them happy before? They feel guilt about making them about making themselves happy because they've lost. They they don't value themselves after the loss, and I think that's also the same whether you lose a relationship of a of of you know a wife or a husband or even a job. There's an element of you devaluing yourself, and so yes. you don't allow yourself to feel to, to to do the things that make you happy. Yeah, yeah, that's that's very true. And what happens is a lot of times we don't understand that it's our body communicating with our brain. So it's working in reverse. And so what happens is, mm. well, I'm going to go do this to make me feel better. How come it's not working? I'm not in the mood, whatever. And it's because the grief is mm. suppressing the the body's ability to experience the happy hormones. And so what needs to happen in that moment, being aware of what's happening in this moment, I don't need to go do what I love. Mm. I need to process the emotion of feeling right now. And we and, suppress and, it and then hit alcohol and drugs and everything else to suppress that. Right, right, exactly. Because a lot of those things can be associated with or tied to our ego. Yeah. All right. Our ego and fear. So... What men do, we drink and I can suppress it and yeah. hide my fear of acknowledging it or, or dealing with it. And so what happens is it doesn't go anywhere. You sober up and it's still there. The grief is still there. It don't go, does it? it that's the thing. Yeah. It doesn't. It's no matter what you do to suppress that emotion or to suppress that feeling, it doesn't take it away. It still exists. And this is where I've always said, no matter what element of grief or the experience of grief, you have to have an awareness and an acceptance because if you don't have acceptance of it, you can't change it. Right. You're, you're absolutely right. And when, and when we say having an acceptance of it, a big part of having an acceptance of your emotions is being present yeah. in what your body is experiencing right now. And so you can be reminiscing about something and say, yeah. I'm going to stop reminiscing about that because it's not doing me any good and I'm going to go do this. And that's a good strategy. That the distraction can yeah. be a good emotion regulation strategy. However, you choose that strategy and you still feel broken well, be present, be mindful. I, in this moment, feel broken. Mm. And then when I can acknowledge that, then I position myself to do something about it in the moment. And that's awareness, ladies and gentlemen, to have an awareness of it. Right. Right. Ex exactly, because what happens is grief, the intensity of grief, and the intrusiveness of grief isn't yeah. a steady state thing. It, it, it ebbs and flows, goes up and down. And so yeah. to be present with your emotions allows you to process an emotion one micro moment to the next. And we have to understand that processing emotions isn't just in your head. You have to process the physiological aspects of grief in your body. That is yeah, why and people don't think about that. Actually, I mean, it, yeah. it's I know in the, the the community that I run with the you know there's, there's guys in there and there's women in there and have lost loved ones so cool. But one of the things that shock them, and even in some of the research I've done, is that they are very surprised at how the grief has affected them in their body. Yes, yes, and and the thing about it is, a lot of people they don't fully understand it. But for some things in life, you don't need the deep scientific understanding. No. You know, let me explain the physiological aspect of grief. Um, when you say it felt like a punch in the stomach, that's all you need. There's your evidence. If, if uh, felt, yeah. I felt it in my chest, that's yeah. it. You felt it in your chest. Do we need to run a functional MRI? Not at all. <laughs> no, we don't. Absolutely not. Yeah. Yeah. But you know, here's the danger, though, and, and I want to jump into this before we finish because um, 
when someone is experiencing gr- and I, grief, whether it's you know the other aspects of grief we're talking about, loss of a loved one, loss of a relationship, loss of a job, or anything else. The other element is is they they go they think they need help and and rather so they're they're not they're losing self compassion right they 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 don't have an awareness that it's grief and they don't know what's happening and their body's changing then what happens is and this is I think is the danger part they'll go to a therapist or a doctor who really cannot empathise because they're coming from only a place of theory and not any relevant experience. And then make things worse by dulling down the emotion by giving drugs. Yeah, see, the, here, here's the thing. Here's the thing about about therapy. Um, because therapists are, are very powerful. Therapy is very powerful. The first thing that has to happen is you have to have a relationship with your therapist. You have to be able to, you have to, be able to connect. It doesn't matter your experience level. It doesn't matter your expertise. Yeah. And so because what happens is and, and you say that it you know therapy can make it worse. Well what the way one way that therapy can make it worse is if you don't have the connection with your therapist. So then you create, Or the therapist or the therapist has no experience. See while while that can happen, here here's my thing with a therapist that has no experience. You don't even get to that if you don't build rapport. Yeah, you don't, absolutely. Yeah, yeah you, I'm with you. you. You don't even get to it because if we have real rapport, I could say to you, if you trust me, not not in my resume, but in my character, yeah. you trust me, then I can say to you, I want to try this thing with you because of how bad it hurts, but I've never done it before. And you can say, well, let's try it because I need help. But if we don't have that rapport then you're not going to allow yourself to be vulnerable enough okay. to yeah. even connect with me. And, and so if I like experience, but we have a good relationship, I can tell you I like experience, which may not be the smartest thing. No. But, but, but it positions us in a way to work together on your grief. But if I think that you don't like me, yeah, your course. level of experience doesn't matter. Well, here let me let me be devil's advocate here as well. Let me say another thing. So, you, let's say you've had t- you, you know you've lost tremendous loss. You, you lose you lose a daughter when you lose one of your daughters. That would just I mean destroy you. But then you you go to a therapist, and this is maybe a grief counselor who has never experienced loss, who has never lost a son, a daughter, a mum, a dad, an aunt, an uncle, or even a pet. They've never lost anyone. Right? How can they? And and this is a thing that Brenny Brown says, you know. And, and I love Brenny Brown, but she talks about you know, being being you know, showing him is getting into the the abyss where you're getting into the well, the dark well that you're in, and empathy and being with you in that moment. You can't do that if you haven't got that experience. If you've never experienced that loss. How can I empathize and feel your loss? And, and even because you, you can never understand someone's personal loss and how they feel. You can only empathize because of your experience. So how, would you, how would, do you see that? Because I, I, I think that's a bigger problem. I, I see it. So there's a couple different things here. So first of all, um, I'll say this. First of all, you're going to be hard pressed to find a therapist who's never dealt with that. Um, second of all, you have to be able to connect because the therapist, well, empathy is connecting with the emotion and yeah. emotions are physiological. And so maybe if I've never experienced that, I know what it feels like for my experience, life experience to impact my appetite the way that I carry myself, my self-esteem. So let me find something that I can work on. That doesn't work if I don't trust the therapist or vice versa. And then the last thing that I'm going to say to you, the last thing, which is very important, is ethics in the profession. Wow, yes. Where where the therapist can say, because I'll I'll tell you this, my expertise, trauma, suicide, 
Emotional yeah. intelligence, positive psychology. So if you were to say to me that you're dealing with schizophrenia, it's not, it's not enough to say, oh, I've never dealt with that before. That's not enough. I need to say, that's not my area of expertise. Let me refer you to someone yes. else. That's my ethics. Ethics is a massive, yeah, massive part of it. Yeah. I, I have to be able to tell you that. Like, look, I and, and so then maybe, and I can say to you, like, look, I'm going to be there for you. And on your worst days, if you need someone to sit with you when you cry, I'll be there for you. But that's the difference. Yes. But the therapeutic process, I cannot do with you because I'm, I'm, I don't have that level of experience. And let me tell you this as a life coach, coaching people. I had a client who, because of what happened during her childhood, she was having a hard time connecting with her daughter. So we worked through that with different forms of cognitive behavioral coaching. Yeah. And her, not only was her relationship with her daughter getting better, and she was almost 40, her daughter was 12, but she was feeling better about herself. She was unlocking mm. new levels of self-love. And then what happened? As those aspects of her brain healed, because it is physiological as well, it opened up a door to other trauma that she had suppressed. So then she calls me, says that she had flashbacks to memories from her childhood that she forgot were there. And so then how did I handle that? I think you need to talk to somebody else. There we go. That is absolutely. And actually, it's funny you mentioned that because that is a fundamental part of my academic research at the moment is the dangers associated with mindful practices, meditative practices, and how the mind, you know, when it, when you're presented and you get through something, then obviously these other emotions come up and they have to, and you have to be able to face them. And if you're not ready for them, it can cause mental imbalance, po possible psychosis and going into even uh, other right. elements of prolonged grief disorder, which is, you know, which is another thing to do. Right. So. And, and, and so in, in this, in this relationship I had with her, you know, so all of the things that you're talking about, healing with therapy begins again with that relationship. Building the relationship, that yeah. Because mm -hmm. we had the kind of relationship where when she says she had flashbacks, I knew it's, be, it's, it's related to her testifying as a child and saying things as a child that got her stepdad put in prison. That so I'm not talking about trauma. her falling off her bike and breaking her arm. Yeah, that's some trauma to deal with. Yeah. So it, as, as a professional, I'm creating the environment where she knows that she can be open with me like that. However, she is responsible to either be vulnerable, be open to that, or saying, I don't think it's a good connection. I'm going to talk to someone else. Yeah. And when you're grieving and you don't feel that connection, go to someone else. Don't waste your time with someone you can't connect with. And the person that you connect with that helps you heal doesn't have to have a license. No, that's true. Yeah, it can be someone that loves you and cares about you and knows and they know how to listen to you. That's like, the big thing. They know how to listen. Because there may be the person that there may be the person that can tell you about prolonged exposure or EMDR. Yeah. And then there's the other person that knows based on the look on your face. You could use tacos and a hug. Yeah. <laughs> like, I, I like that's the, tacos and a hug. So <laughs> yeah, that's so, for me. <laughs> and, and so and, and I'll say this, you know, piggybacking on what I just said. So the fact that everyone in your life, if they've never grieved before, they will grieve at some point in the future. Yes, yeah, inevitable. Yeah. The way to prepare for that is to be vulnerable and honest and open in your relationships. Absolutely. Brilliant. What else can we say? Yeah. And, and, and think about this. Here, here's, here's my challenge. Here's my challenge for the listeners. Make a list of the people that you love the most. 
and then write down the month and year of the last time you gave them a real hug. And if you can't think of it, fix that. Wow. That's awesome, Charleston. That is now, ladies and gentlemen, before we finish off, that is the last thing we're going to say there. But that is that's your that's your homework, right? That's homework from Charleston. We will be back. This is this was part two, but we are going to be back and doing more. I think. Yes. I think the next one we will. I think the next one we should tackle, Charleston, is loss of identity and go even deeper into the identity side of things um, because it, it, that's exactly. massive. It, <laughs> it really is, and it's really something that we can jump on right now for the next hour. I um, know, but we don't. Obviously, we realize we've been over. We've been over an hour today, and we we want you to come back. We want you to make sure yes. that you subscribe because you know this 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 pillars of grief is yes, it's about the loss of a loved one. It's about the loss of. It's about loss. It's about bereavement. It's about the impact in your life, and that covers so many avenues. And this is why. I have my good friend here, Dr. Charlton Gaines, and we'll be tackling other subject matters, especially as we move forward. But you've got, you've heard it. He's given you homework, and we expect homework to be done, or we'll want to know why. <laughs> <laughs> we, yeah. We'll be expecting. And so, if you, you know, if you've got something you want to ask us, if there's something in this episode that just strikes a chord with you, or you, you're confused then drop us a message and, and we'll tackle that and you know we'll we'll deal with that. We'll answer that question for you. So Charleston, uh it's always awesome to 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 you know bring our minds together and talk about these subject matters. And I love the fact that we dive into the psych of it. But um there's so much more that we've 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 got to cover, so much more that we've got to do as well. All right. Well, I'm grateful. I'm grateful to be here and I'm grateful to have these conversations with you um, because because it's needed. Yeah, right. It's, it is. it's it's needed. It's necessary. And it's not even about being necessary for all of these other people. Like you and I get something out of these conversations. Yeah, absolutely. I, I am not above learning. I'm not above feeling. Yeah. I'm not about I, I I learn just as much. We 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 both learn as we talk on these on these the, these conversations and it helps us to move forward, research more, find out more. But the the thing is is that if we say something or Charleston says something that hits a chord with you, that's what it's about. If we can educate you so that because you heard in this episode, ladies and gentlemen, that the biggest problem is people don't know they're going through grief. If you don't know what you're experiencing, how can you fix it? So if we can help you to be just, even if you're someone who's listening now and you know someone that might be fit in that pattern and they don't know, then maybe you're the person that can support them and say, hey, you might actually be grieving and this is how we can tackle it. Yes. So let us know. Keep in touch with us. Final thoughts, my friend. Um, my final thoughts is do not let your ego or insecurity be the barrier to your healing. Brilliant. Fantastic. Love it. And those of you who are watching the video on YouTube, just ignore the little wobbly camera at the beginning because he was having an episode. <laughs> he was so um, God bless, guys. We will be back definitely. And there'll be there's other episodes that's coming up. And then Charles and I will be back and we'll be tackling another subject matter. That will probably be identity. But if you want something, if you want us to talk about something that really is in your heart, let us know. We will do that. God bless. Yeah.